Looks like we've pretty much got everyone. Um, my name is John Hubbard, and uh, I've been working on a set of APIs called pin user pages. These are variations on, uh, on get user pages. So I, I really want to walk around, but I'm not supposed to, right? <laughs> um, so today we have a, a few minutes to get MM and, and file system people together in the same room uh, at you know, great expense, and, uh, and we don't have much time to talk about this, um, so I'm really excited that we were able to, you know, have a moment to go through this because it's important to get both perspectives on this because this is a API between MM and file system, and it's, uh, it's had troubles. So um, what I want to do is, is kind of get to the last slides quickly. I've got a few slides to talk about um, the original problem and uh, <clears throat> one slide for uh, some of the early solution approaches that we had, and a couple slides to talk about where we are today, and a couple of pictures for illustration purposes, just to show you some of the call stacks. Um, and then a couple of slides to discuss the actual solutions. So um, let's not, I'm gonna try not to linger on the, you know, the initial slides. So, so what I wanna do is, is try to just raise awareness of, of the problem that we've got, um, plan out a general direction for the solution so that once we get past the current to-do items, then we actually have a solution. Now, um, this has been somewhat controversial in the past, uh, so I've, I've tried to set this up carefully and not say certain words like file leasing until I get to the end, so. <laughs> um, Here's the, uh, a little background on the original problem. And uh, Jan Kara had a really clear write-up that I keep going back to. Um, it was kind of fun because I, I was sitting at a, a lunch uh, with LSF MM when N NVIDIA tagged me with a bug, uh, a customer bug, that actually had the same backtrace. And so I was literally talking with people about it. Um, and, and they were telling me, yeah, that, this, is, this is what's going on. Um, this, this one is, th there's kind of two variations of this problem. Uh, this one's especially helpful because it talks about uh, direct I.O., which is less obvious, uh, at least to me, than, than the other way you can get it. Uh, the other way you can get it is by uh, pinning pages with get user pages and then using a device like an accelerator and then marking the pages dirty with set page dirty um, and then releasing them and that will lead you into this. But that's kind of obvious. Um, whereas this one is direct I.O. and you're not involving a device at all. Well, there's a disk, but you're not involving a device really. And, and you can still run into trouble. So we can come back to the slide if, if necessary. It's got a lot of stuff on it, but um, there you are. Uh, and here is a summary of what that slide is, is actually showing you, which is that um, Page pinning is invisible to the file system. So the file system, if you look at the bottom box, it expects that if you say write begin um, and then do some I.O. and then write end, that you know, as, as long as you don't have mappings, as long as the page isn't mapped somewhere, uh, the, the file shouldn't, the pages shouldn't have uh, any changes to them outside of those brackets. Same with page make write or, or write page. So the file system has a, a particular view of the world that, that you have destroyed by calling either pin user pages or get user pages on that range. Because what that does is it, it raises the reference count. Uh, if we go back to the last slide, you'll see the details of why that all falls apart. Um, so <laughs> the, the, I was really shocked to, to find out that this was not only a, a problem, but a long-standing problem, and that it had just sort of slipped through the cracks because it's is pretty big. Um, the fact that MM sees the world one way, which is you can just, you know, we, we move pages around, you can pin them, they come, they go, and the file system sees it another way, <laughs> which is, you know, here is the rules for writing to, to files, uh, or pages, rather, um, and it was just never the twain shall meet, so anyway. Um, all right, so we chatted about it, and we came, out, uh, came up with some, some early approaches to how this should be solved. And after some discussion, we, f we figured, well, let's provide a way to identify pinned pages, and then use that information, plus 
maybe some other stuff that we're not sure about yet to decide what to do when page reclaim um, or, or something finds a, finds a pin page. Um, so to turn that into a little bit more detail, um, we came up with pin user pages, which is, uh, it's kind of like, it, it's, it's the same as if you called get user pages, but you pass in a, a follow pin flag. That's why we keep saying follow pin around here. Um, so I put a little note there about terminology. If we say follow pin, pin user pages, DMA pin, that all means pretty much the same thing, roughly. Um, and the output of that whole thing is, is a function called, called page maybe DMA pinned, um, which makes me unhappy because it's, it's got a maybe in there. And I keep trying to turn it into one that is not a maybe. Um, but then <laughs> people tell me that I can't have that many counter bits. And so we're stuck, <laughs> we're stuck with maybe. Um, although, you know, if you get rid of all the other fields in, in the struct page and you're down to just like, you know, a couple, then you could put a couple of counters in there. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I do think there is a path to getting you some bits in the base uh, struct folio. I'm not going to guarantee you anything about struct page, but for struct folio, I am planning on, I, I think actually maybe we talked about this already, I'm, I'm planning on getting map count down to just a few bits, and so the current field that's being used for map count, we can also use for pin count. Hmm. But you can't have perhaps as many bits as you might like. We might need to go to some kind of saturating scheme or something that says, yeah, it's pinned, but you know, we don't know exactly how many times. So is, is there some kind of way to find out how many times a, D, a page is DMA pinned, even if it's quite expensive? Is, is there some, some way to find out how many times it's pinned? Uh, yeah, so, so in, instead of keeping a precise count, could we keep kind of a sloppy count and go back and, and figure out, oh no, she actually is zero now. I, I, I know it was high, but now it's really quite low and maybe it's actually zero. Oh, so uh, kind of a right combining counter. Something like that, yeah. Uh, probably not, because it's, it has to count up and count down as people coming, or as callers come and go. Yeah, I mean, maybe we can keep some kind of side data structure and, and figure it out. So, so you just look in the page and you say, yes, it definitely is pinned or it's definitely not pinned. And if you, because... Uh, a side data structure would solve everything. Um, yeah. And we, we haven't gone there because, oh, everything's in the page and performance. But maybe if we're pushed hard enough and we need a non-fuzzy result, maybe it's time to just start scribbling, you know, data structures, a bunch of them, one per page on the side. It's been... Yeah. Uh, we don't do DMA things that often, so, uh, so uh, direct I/O stuff that often, and direct I/O takes quite a long time. So making a side data structure sounds like a good idea. So you just got it just holds one count on the page. I mean, has a, I don't know whether you've got a flag to spare to say this is pinned. But then, if it's pinned, then you can go and look in a, your cache of the side structures. I, doubt there'll be that many of them on the system at any one time. That's that intriguing. But the file system um, could just make one, say. And, and yeah, we, we looked at page owner, um, which is kind of a variation on that, but then you have to be configured for it. But that that's that's like a bad version of a, a struct on the side, I guess. So never mind. But yeah. But but having the 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 side data structure with the actual count in it. Mm -hmm. and then just a bit in the fast path because the DMA operations are slower. They're not always a fast path operation. I, I know that's not oh. always true, but it's, it's done less, less often. And so you can right. afford the extra dereference to go into this other data structure and do your counts there, but then page reclaim and other things can just, you know, they just say, oh, it's pinned, I'll leave it or you know. That's a good point, and, and I, I don't know why that's been overlooked. I, I think, yeah, I'm just thinking back about how that went through, but yeah, that, yeah, that could just, really work. You know, and then just, um, you know, you only go off and find this other counter when you need it. One thing it would break is the, uh, the existing uses of this, because copy and write has already jumped on this 
so we may end up leaving this in place and then adding a side data structure. So, um, um, uh, like, I'm wondering, like, for for uh, pages that are in the page cache that you will care about pinning, in which scenarios would you actually run into false positives? I think the bias is right now is something like 1,024, yes. which means you would have to get 1,024 references on a page until you get like a false positive. H how could that happen? <laughs> uh, think, think about a page from libc. If, you, if you're running 1,024 processes, you've got it mapped 1,024 times. Okay. Because like the, the the point I'm trying to make is like for for um, for anonymous pages, I think I can get them maybe out of there. Uh, I can special case, for example, if a page is exclusive, I I know it's never going to be pinned, and I don't have to care about that with the new semantics that are introduced. I was wondering if you can come up with something something similar that we we tweak somehow, for example, the bias in a way that it is different for file pages and for other pages stuff like that, that we can special case based on the page type, which bias might actually be preferable or not. Maybe that would give you like more bits to make it less likely to happen or something like that. That, that sounds like a good idea. I'm a little bit lost. I didn't quite follow where, where this. Uh... My, my question to Willie was when would you ever pin a libc page? Oh, I see. I mean, maybe for VM migration or something? Uh, I can definitely answer that. I mean, if you're doing something like, uh, I know we want to rename it, but HMM, which is basically migrating pages back and forth between an accelerator device and a and But, and but you do that with a libc code page? Uh, actually, no, but the, 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 the page of libc is mapped so many times it looks like it's DMA pinned. And so oh, okay. You're saying it overflows into the pin count. Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. That's a different issue. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, okay, so I want to try, that's, that's good, that's very helpful. Let's see if we can get a little bit further. Um, let's see, okay, so this is just status. We'll, we'll go through this kind of quickly. Um, the, one of the things we learned while um, converting various callers, a call site is something that calls get user pages, is that basically if you're touching the page contents as opposed to something in struct page, usually you want to use pin user pages. Um, Otherwise, you just get user pages. Um, so most, most things are converted except for the file systems, uh, which appear to need an all-at-once conversion. I'll, I'll show you a slide in a minute. Um, and let's see, is there anything else to mention on this? Oh, yeah. I, I, <laughs> the low-level note at the bottom I thought was interesting because while I was converting a lot of these callers, I noticed that they were... Um, they were, they were doing that pattern. They were calling, uh, you know, you pin the pages, do something, set pages dirty, unpin. And so I factored it, you know, cleverly factored it into unpin user pages dirty lock and converted a whole bunch of things. And now it, it looks like the pattern itself was wrong um, because that's basically how you get into this bug <laughs> is you're calling set pages dirty outside of file system knowledge. And so, You've, you've destroyed the world. I can't see how that can ever possibly be right, and yet it was all over the place, and so now it's cleverly converted into a, a central caller function so that all the evil is concentrated in one, in one spot. Um, so uh, the second page out of two on status, uh, uh, ext4 has a workaround now that avoids the original crash, so um, ted so commit uh, right there, uh, and that that's pretty convenient. It still leaves things corrupted, but at least doesn't crash the kernel. So it just says, okay, if you know, page buffers are missing, don't, don't try to use them. Um, and then meanwhile, um, this copy and write thing, which there's been articles about and a lot of discussion about, I'm sure everyone's seen that go by, that's actually using um, page maybe DMA pinned to help make a decision about what you should do when you're forking and, and doing a copy and write. Um, which is why I say that the side structure may not work or not, it, it can work, but the side structure may have to be in addition to what we already have if we want this to continue to work. Um, this shows a few of the uh, selected call paths. I just very carefully picked the things that I wanted to see um, so I could tell the difference between, you know, what's doing IO map, 
what's doing get page versus get user pages, uh, what's funneling through the IOVEC, uh, um, IO, IOV iter get pages paths, and what's not, and, and what, do I, what do I have to convert and what do I get for free? So I have a, a small patch set right now that goes and converts um, some of the stuff near the bottom. So, uh, you know, instead of IOV get pages, uh, IOV eater get pages, it, it makes the conversion. Um, and that automatically takes care of a lot of things. I think it takes care of all the things that are calling IOMAP or that are using IOMAP, but it leaves a lot of things not fixed, like a bunch of the network file systems um, and just a few stray things there that kind of blow up in your face when you look in there. And, and the reason, um, let me go to the next one just to show you. Uh, at the end, when you're all done doing IO and everything, you, you call bio release pages for the, for the direct IO thing. And I just showed this because everything funnels into that, but you can't, it's kind of like you can't get there from here. You know, you toss your, your bio submit in at the top and it goes through a bunch of machinery that you, believe me, you can't, you can't do much about. And at the end, um, you've lost all track of everything except, okay, your pages come back and now you can call bio release pages. And bio release pages at the moment is calling put page. That has to be converted um, because it has to be converted to unpin user page. So now that that's converted to unpin user page, that means everything that put it in on the top up here on the submission path had better have called pin user page instead of get user page. So after weaseling around for months, poking around at ways to you know, do an all uh, an easy conversion, I find that some of these things are gonna have to be um, converted, you know, go into that file system, sort out which things are doing a get page and which are doing a get user page and, and keep track of those. So the call site needs to know the difference between pages that were acquired from um, get user pages versus get page. Uh, so since there's all these file system people here, I just wanna point out that if anyone were so inclined to go, you know, factor things appropriately for some of these file systems, it wouldn't, wouldn't hurt my feelings at all because <laughs> that's tricky for someone who doesn't know the code. Okay, so here we have um, just a couple of slides. One to help you visualize where we're going. So this is the original problem with a little file lease <clears throat> box on top. Um, and then just keep that in mind and we'll go to uh, a list here. And we have, I guess, 12 minutes. And uh, in those 12 minutes, I wanna walk out here with a completely uh, finished design for what to do <laughs> after uh, all the conversions are done. So imagine that we've converted everything that's supposed to to call pin user pages, and that's all very nice. Now you know what's pinned, um, but so what? <laughs> Everything's still broken. Um, so the proposal here, um, which is not something I invented, um, is right in the middle. Um, require a file lease page. Uh, require that someone for this page range, you have to take a file lease on that range, on the address range, I guess you could call it, before you're allowed to call pin user page or uh, uh, with the opt-in idea, perhaps before you're allowed to call pin user page when you pass in follow lease, which is, I just made up. Um, the advantage of this is that it's a correct solution. It connects file system and MM. You know, if you're, if you're going to go work on these pages that are associated with a file system, you have to connect it to the file system somehow. And this is really the, the only proposal that I remember hearing that clearly solved it. Um, so I will throw it open to comments, discussion. Do you love it, hate it? Is there something better? Um, and how many people will it take to get Ira off of CXL and onto working on file leases? <laughs> wow. Yes, we are there. <laughs> I was just gonna say that leases were hard. There was a lot of roadblocks that I don't even remember anymore. Um, but I, I agree that you know the file systems need to be more ma made aware of this, and there's need to be communication. But the file systems don't always like to let go <laughs> of their pages. Yeah, watch so what I'll you say. Time. You got a file system guy behind you. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I don't care about that solution. I can imagine some people being potentially worried about it, right? Because. Oh, yeah. What's gonna happen is you're, we were basically telling the file system that 
all of the pages in this one gigabyte range may be marked dirty at some point in the future. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that if those pages don't have blocks allocated to them yet, we're gonna have to allocate blocks to all of those pages. If it's a reflinked file and we're going to be potentially doing copy on write when the page is marked dirty, then the file system is going to have to do a copy on write operation on that entire one gigabyte range, even if none of the pages actually are ever dirty. Now, but, but they will be, believe me. They, yeah. If oh, you so did this, you case, did it because right? you're gonna scribble on the pages. Yeah. If, if the use case is one where eventually they all will be dirty in any way, then I, you, I know, mean, we, doing we, it the you actually want right that behavior at definitely. the beginning, great, right? Yeah. Yeah, I actually have. So much worse. <laughs> I I have actually implemented already what you want for network file system, and then I've abandoned it because <laughs> truncate and also uh, direct I/O and a couple of other things. It's actually really hard to get right. So I, I've implemented it. I kind of have it working. If you want to look at the code. It, I can point it for you at branch with it. Please do. But it's really hard to get right. And I don't care about truncate. We shouldn't care about truncate. Uh, unfortunately, some people do. <laughs> and it gets even more fun if someone's doing it right and then someone does an appallocate to take a hole out of that. It, so you might end up squidging your stuff down. Plus, when it comes to network file systems, you have to deal with bits of your a range that have different authentication things on them that you end up having to merge and stuff like that. So yeah, I can give you code that, <laughs> point of code that does this. And I thought it's just too, too complicated, but you want to come to have a look. It would be good to see. Uh, this is, does not sound promising. <laughs> so I, I might not fully understand the, the leases that you have in mind, but at least for ButterFS, um, it's not just the set page dirty isn't is a big problem, but it's not the only problem. The reason why we care about set page dirty is also because before we do I/O on a page, we basically uh, lock it down so the page can't change anymore because we take a checksum of the page, and we it's kind of important like if we checksum it that it doesn't change after that because we want the checksum to match, right? Um, well, one idea so. I got involved in this because I do RDMA or did at one point, and then I had problems with PMEM. One of the one of the use cases that we see is for RDMA, and if RDMA is DMA to the page, you probably shouldn't be writing it back anyway. And so one one process could be user space has to lease the page, they pin the page with their memory regions, they do their I/O and they're doing whatever, and then if they want to actually f-sync that page that they have to release the lease and then that turns it back over you know releases it from the mm turns it back over the file system file system does their thing i don't know if that would be performant for all rdma apps that's a lot of overhead for rdma apps but you know maybe i don't know no i mean like the the shit sucks, right? Like the, <laughs> this is like, this is the biggest barrier that we have to page cache sharing because the fact that the MM can just kind of go behind our backs and like mark things as dirty is a huge problem for us. So I don't particularly care if the, the solution is onerous or whatever, because mm. it's gotta be fixed. And like, and then that's to say nothing to the, like the Odirect, like, user space can just change things. Cause like I, I straight up have to tell users like, yeah, don't use Odirect with Windows VMs cause your file system will be corrupted because the checksums won't match. You have to turn off che data checksumming for these virtual images, right? The, these are terrible user, inter uh, like user interactions, user experiences, that's what I'm trying to say, that exist purely out of our own doing, right? <laughs> like right. we control all of this we're the ones that set the pro like how these things work. I'm not super thrilled with the idea of saying, okay, this range may become dirty at some point in the future because ButterFS has a lot of scaffolding that has to be set up for a dirty range. We have to uh, like reserve space. And not only that, it was like, we have to be able to write that space back in order to reclaim space in order to make forward progress under like, you know, space conditions, right? So like being told that this area may become dirty at some point, but there's nothing we can do about it 
until the lease is up or right. whatever is like, puts us in a bind, right? That, that's just something that user space has always been able to do and I think that's something that maybe not everyone thinks about yeah. because with DIO, you think about DIO being to and from the file descriptor bypassing the page cache. But the corner case is that the, the buffer that you're doing direct IO to or from can be an M mapped file from the same file system or from another file system. Yep. And user space can actually cause potentially interesting deadlocks if your file system doesn't handle this because the buffer can be M mapped from the same file that you're doing DIO to or from. So I'm also wondering, how, how is this going to affect the DIO fast path if we then have to get a lease in order to pin a page first? I think the important thing is that that's a really damn rare thing to do, right? I mean, most users don't do that. Mo mo most of the times you see that being done, it's a test suite. And it's a test suite, <laughs> really? Uh, I, it's, it's definitely so not something that, that user space normally does, but I uh, think adversarially. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and like I always, because there's a very special path. We have a special path specifically for this problem, ButterFS. Like, and it's very poorly tested until uh, we started running ButterFS more widely in production. And suddenly we were tripping over this all of the time. And this, because the only way I know how to trigger it consistently is MMAP DIO write into an MMAP region, or M DIO read into an MMAP region. Like I can trigger this code path every single time. I don't think we're doing that in production, but I can trip this code path consistently all of the time, thousands of times a second. So somebody is doing something in this area. I have yet to figure out what it is. Yeah, that's what the original uh, um, bug report yeah, DIO was. was read in, like th this is how I repro reproduce problems. Is like I know how to trigger the path and simply DIO read into an mmapped region. Oh. Yeah, that's the, the original slide at the beginning was that. Yeah. So like that's that's my test case, and I have an XFS test, and XFS has to test the deadlock because we have to do all of this like oh somebody dirtied the page and didn't tell us. Now we have to like have an async worker thread that goes and does all of the things that was supposed to be done at like MK write time for us, and then we can submit the page for writing. I, I think fixing this may cause performance regressions in some cases, but on the other hand, if it wasn't correct to begin with, your performance was an illusion. Right, yeah, that, <laughs> this is kind of where I go back and forth, right, because, you know, ButterFS is, you know, ext4 doesn't have this problem, XFS doesn't have this problem, like, they don't do data checksumming, so like, nobody ever notices, but ButterFS notices because your Windows VMs are start throwing EIOs because checksums don't match. And like, ButterFS is, paying the price for this all over the place. And my approach has been, you know, play stupid games, win stupid prizes, like turn off data check summing for this or whatever. Uh, but that's clearly a not mm -hmm. great solution. But in the end, we have DIO specifically to be the fast pass. So we are kind of letting our users run with scissors a little bit. <laughs> so should we do all of this work to make it better or not? I, I don't know. I certainly would like it for things like page cache sharing and other stuff, but. Well, that's interesting. So you say, should we do this? So I guess you're thinking that leaving it as is is, um, is gonna work out. I, um, it, I'm not necessarily saying that. I'm just saying that if the, the solution is all of a sudden all DIO for applications that are behaving properly suddenly tank, that's not a valid solution, right? Right. So, so Joseph, uh, I just wanted to say it's not just ButterFS that suffers from this problem. It's any file system on top of RAID 5. Because yeah. you've done your parity calculation and now it's wrong. Oops. Right. Uh, without RAID 5 double buffering, right? That, that would be so iSCSI double, but whatever it is. But one of the things that we could do is maintain the fast path for places where the checksumming or for whatever reason the pages are allowed to change while in flight. File systems can intentionally turn it on for specific cases and then move over to leases uh, for our common cases. Yeah, because I mean like ButterFS is clearly not winning like the, the speed award for this, this path anyway. And so like I'm willing to eat it just for correctness for us. 
And we already have like the stable page helpers, so you can just be like, okay, this file system requires stable pages. D do the least thing, and otherwise leave. You know, so that, that follow lease on the flags probably would help you then. So if the call site passes in follow lease, it says I'm ready for the new behavior, and if it doesn't, then it's not. Yep. Okay. I mean, that would be reasonable for me. Okay. I'm out of time, so I will let Ira come up. I think you're next. 